<clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Rodney Robinson, 2019 Teacher of the Year. Thank you for the, joining us on today. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm blessed to be here. Very good, very good. So we know that the month of February is Black History Month. And so what the School of Education here at Virginia University have decided to do is to interview prominent African-American educators for this month to talk about the importance of education. So we're very excited to kick off this month with you being the Teacher of the Year 2019. So how awesome is that? So we're excited for that. So we're going to just go right into a few questions. Um, and get some feedback from you if that's okay. I'm good. Um, Let's go. <laughs> definitely. So the first question I wanted to ask is first tell us a little bit about yourself and why did you choose education as a career? Well, um, I'm a country boy. You know, I grew up in King William County, Virginia, which is about about 35, 40 minutes outside of Richmond. Um, so growing up in the country, it was just country living, enjoying that lifestyle. But the main thing that inspired me to become a teacher was my mother. My mother, she wanted to become a teacher growing up. However, segregation and poverty got in the way of her getting an education to become a teacher. But she didn't let that stop her. She ran an in-home daycare. So any days, 20, 30 kids in our household, my mom taking care of everybody, showing them their love and giving them what they need. But more importantly, she taught us all about community. She would always say that it's our job to build the community and make things better for the next generation. You know, I remember growing up, my mom said, hey, get on your bike and go down the street and check on Mr. Johnson. Check on Miss <laughs> Wallace to see if she needs right. things from the store. It's just that that community that I grew up in and my mother just watching her <clears throat> just always inspired me, just the amount of respect that she had, the love that she got from people, adults and children. And I, I said, I, I want that. I want to be that pillar of the community. And another reason I got an education was simply growing up in rural Virginia, I didn't get a cultural education. You know, I got a I got a good academic education. It wasn't the greatest in, um, in the school system, but I lacked that cultural relevance. You know, I only had one black male teacher my entire education career. And so I and he was my band teacher. So I took him every year, you know, not just because, you know, I was in band, but I just took it because I had that role model that person who could show me the way, who could give me that confidence boost because I wasn't getting it in any of my other classes. And so I always said, I want to be that teacher for, for my students. Awesome. That's, that's awesome. Um, so with that, in the beginning of your education career, you know, as educators, we always have our philosophy of education. So what what is your philosophy of education and over the course of the year since you've been in education, how has your philosophy changed? Well, my philosophy of education, it, it just has grown and changed over the years. I tell teacher, I tell people all the time, if you're the same teacher last year that you are this year, you're not growing. You need to grow and change and adapt because our students are growing and adapting and changing every day. But mainly when I first started, I was 21 years old in charge of a class of 140 seventh graders. Wow. So that was just a just a wake up call. But the thing that saved me, and I tell people this all the time, was I had great male, black male mentors my first couple years in education. You know, when I first started um, at Brown Middle School, my principal, actually my mentor that year was David Hudson. He's an award winning principal of Frank. Franklin Military was still, um, not still, Linwood Halton, but he's award winning educator, everybody knows. And then I moved, my second year I was at George Ruth High School and I coached and I worked with Rodney Berry, who's now the superintendent of um, education, of superintendent of correctional education in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so growing up, you know, learning the ropes from just two great educators made me who I am. They taught me so many things, but the key thing, I remember my, fourth year in education, I switched from George Wilf to John F. Kennedy. And I was still struggling. And I had another male mentor, Stanley Stokes, who was my principal. And he asked me a question. He said, who are your best students in your class? And I said, my football players. And he said, why? Why are, you, why are your football players better? I was like, because they know me. I know them. And there ain't no messing around. We get it done. And he said, well, let me ask you a question. Why can't you have that relationship with all your students? 
Mm. And it's the moment when it clicked to me. It's really not about, you know, knowing your content and, and all this. It's really about knowing kids, right. building relationships with the kids, with the community. And so I always set out to make sure that I'm going to build with they, I'm going to teach a kid. I'm not teaching a subject, even though history is my subject. I teach children. And so whenever kids come to my class, we spend the first week or two just getting to know each other, learning more about the neighborhoods, learning more about who they are as a person, making those connections that we have in common. And then we can go from there because the old adage is true. They don't care how much you know till right. they know how much you care about them. You know, I hate cliches, but that one is about education is really what it's all about. It's about showing your love for the kids, the community, and that you genuinely have their well-being in mind. And that's the best education philosophy you can have. All else will fall into place once those kids believe in you and that they they believe that you have their best interests in mind. Awesome. I think that's important, you know, having their best interest and in fostering a relationship. You know, that is so vital. I preach that all the time about relationships are so important. When I was in the classroom, building those relationships with students, uh, because if they don't sense that you care, you're not going to get their attention. You're not going to get feedback, and they're not going to do nothing that you say do, but the relationships are so vital for that. Yeah, especially working in urban areas when you deal with so many kids who feel like they're just a clog in the system. And yes. so if you treat them that way, then you're not going to get anything out of them but the bare minimum, they just, I'm under, they think I'm just an interruption to your day. But if you build that relationship and say, no, you are my day, you are, right. and I get up and I want to make sure that you do well, then they will be, you will be the reason they get up and they want to do well. Yes, exactly, exactly. All right, so as an educator, in particular, as an African-American male, what are some significant challenges that you have faced in your career and how have you overcome those challenges? Well, the main, the thing that I've over, you know, when you're an African American male educator, yeah. you're, you're kind of like, you know, my friend Brian Coleman, who's the 2021 20, school counselor of the year, he calls us unicorns, meaning that we're rare in most cases and that yes. are defined. And so the key thing is just to build community. You know, mm -hmm. always work, you know, always reach out to other African American male educators, always reach out to parents, to the community, reach out to people who have like interests and like some like situations because you have to build community. There's right. no community there, you have to build it. And by right. building that community, you build a network of support. I always, say, I always tell people, look, it's a community. I'm gonna reach down to pull the next man up behind me, you know, while I'm reaching up for the man in front of me. And mm -hmm. that's the philosophy my mom taught me, you know, just it's all about community. You have to work with people, you have to build people up because it's lonely, it's hard work, and it's very lonely if you're trying to do it all by yourself. I tell people the worst thing you can do as a teacher is to go in that classroom, close your door and teach, because that is lonely. You yeah. have to build the network, you have to build a community, and you have to work with everybody to make your job and their job easier. And always uplift the next person, that's the key. When I remember whenever I would have, um, they would have new teacher orientation or convocation for the district, I would always go around and look for the young brother who's in his first year that's looking confused because I'm going to take them under my wing and I'm going to say, hey, this is how I got through it. These are the people who can mm -hmm. get you through it and just building up that network. And, you know, I got so many friends and, you know, some kind of family members from that because they know we have each other's best interests at heart. And we're going to hold each other accountable. Right. Sometimes we have some real, real tough conversations. Sometimes I often tell you, I don't need friends who can agree with me. I need friends who will disagree with me and tell me when I'm wrong and to challenge me and push me to do better because that's what I want. And that's how you make it. You have to find that network or that community of educators like that. All right. And I think something you said important in your prior statement as well, what you said, mentoring. Yes. The African American males, yes. you know, in education. I think that's because it's so rare. Yes. But mentoring them and having them to know that this is how these are your strategies. These are you being successful. And to even recruit them, you yes. know, is a challenge in itself because it's such of a need um, for that. Um, so, in the you know, education as far as of color has always been 
a field that you know African Americans chose. But of course, over the years, that has somewhat has changed for what whatever reasons. Why do you feel that individuals of color are no longer choosing that career path in education? And what could be some strategies to recruit and to retain them to go into education? <laughs> well, you know, I'm a history teacher, so I, I always like to go into the history of it. Right. The fact of the matter is, we were told we weren't wanted. That this that this education system isn't for us. You know, one of the fallouts from Brown versus Board of Education was the loss of 38,000 teachers, principals, educators of color. And so ever since then, they sort of been pushed out of the education center. center. And so we had nobody to tell the next generation of kids, hey, you can be a teacher. Teaching is a great profession for you. We didn't have anyone to build up the next generation of teachers. And so our kids grow up and they think, oh, I can get into sports, I can get into accounting, I can get into all sorts of fields. But no one ever tells our young men and young women, look, that leadership that you have, that's what it takes to be a teacher. That patience that you have, those are qualities that will make a great teacher. And so we really need to start to change the narrative. We need to start making them feel welcome in school. We know that children of color have the worst experiences in school. And I often say nobody wants to go back to their, to their place of trauma as a, as a career field. So we have to create better experiences for them. And then we just have to open up education as a welcoming space and say, hey, you would be a great teacher. I'm going to show you how. Then we need to I tell people all the time, you need to put our money where our mouth is. We need to right. start giving scholarships. We need to start building teacher for tomorrow programs in high school, middle schools, and really start our kids, see, start with our kids and have them see education is a viable career field. You know, as teachers, sometimes I say, you know, if we were car salesmen, we would never sell any cars because we right. have to complain far too often about education. Well, the students hear that. And so yes. they say, oh, well, I ain't, I'm not going to the, going into education. Look at what my teacher's going through. We need to do a better job of marketing the profession. Teaching was once the best job an African-American person could have in this country. It's time for us to just start advertising and showing that, hey, it is still an honorable profession, you know, and it comes with, we need to give them some more money. Let's be honest. You know, Wall Street Journal said teaching is just not a smart career move based on the amount of student loans and everything that you have to take. So right. we need to get more money. We need to uplift the profession. And we just need to start early with telling young black and brown children, you can be a teacher, then providing the supports to show them how to be a teacher. Right. Very good. And I think that's important, you know what I mean, to demonstrate how to do that and that it's not the the bottom of the pole. Like yeah. years ago, it used to be so respectful. And you know, when you see your teacher out and about, you'd be like, oh my God, like a celebrity. Like yeah. you actually go out, you actually shop. You know, but nowadays it's not sought at that profession. And it's not looked up to that level, which it should be. It's yeah. a notable profession. One thing I always do with the students in Richmond, I start talking about their school names. Our schools in Richmond are named after some powerful, powerful black educators from yes. Lucia Brown to Virgie Benford. To, we have some powerful, powerful black educators whom our schools are named after. There's no reason a child should go to a school named after a black educator and not take some sort of pride in that. So we really have to do our job in uplifting the profession. Very good. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so in this book, In Other People's Children's Cultural Conflict in the Classroom, Lisa Delpit, um, she uses conversation with teachers, students, and parents uh, from different backgrounds. And she talks about how everyday interactions are loaded with assumptions made by educators and mainstream society about the capacity of students of color and low social economic background. Most classroom teachers are led by white females. What can be done to combat this assumption of their perception that they have of schools in low social economic backgrounds? One thing I always tell them is just you never assume anything about about a student. You know, go in with a blank slate. I, you know, you know, it's all saying about what you do when you assume things. Right. You know, you know what I mean? But really, go in with a blank slate and get to know your students get to know their parents, get to know their community, get to know the history of their community because you didn't, those parents and students didn't just end up where they are. There's a st specific and strategic history of the city, of the area where they live that put them in that place. 
And once you get to know that, then you need to start understanding classism. You know, I think a lot of our teachers get caught up in certain things and not realize it's a lot of classism in our, you know, in our society, especially our black teachers. Let's be honest. We got to hold them accountable, too. That's true. They come in with a lot of negative assumptions about our kids. So I always tell people, never assume anything because our kids are so very, so different, so talented. And the best thing you can do is just get to know them. But more importantly, do your research. Do your research on the community. Do your research on your children. One thing I always do is I have my kids fill out this long form every day, the first day of school. And they're like, why do you want to know so much about me? Because I need to know because I want to make the best decision for you. I right. want to know, who you, do you have any brothers or sisters or cousins that go to this school? Because I may have taught them. And that's something we can use to build a bridge and build a relationship. Exactly. You know, I may know something about the community that can help you help your family. And mm -hmm. so it's really important for all teachers, black, white, male, female, just to remove all assumptions when you go into an environment and just become a blank slate. You will learn more from your kids than those kids will ever learn from you. And so as long as you keep that mindset, you will do well in serving the kids in the community. That's true. Very good. And I think a lot of times as educators, um, we, you know, the term of implicit bias um, with the teachers um, and how they're entitled, but that goes in hand with the relationships of knowing them and not necessarily being biased and because we tend to prejudge when they come in. You know, I used to always use this analogy when I was a teacher, my first and second year of teaching, I taught at a Title I school um, and kids come just a certain way Black teachers, African American teachers, Caucasian teachers, you tend to judge something and not even build a relationship with the kids. And it's important, like you said, to build those relationships, to get to kind of know them and to combat these assumptions that we have on these kids and and understand those reasons so you know how to do your classrooms, lessons, activities in general. Yep. It's I'll, very vital. I tell teachers all the time that mirror is the biggest tool for yes. you have. You have to look in that mirror. You have to ask yourself the tough questions, and more importantly, you got to be honest with yourself. Yes. You know, there were plenty of days where I came, where after class, I was like, that lesson didn't go well at all. Right. <laughs> but I, <laughs> you know, I got one planning period to make this lesson better for the next group, and then I got another few minutes to make it even better for the group after that. Right. You should always right. constantly strive for growth, growth and ask yourself those tough questions and be honest. Right, definitely, definitely. Um, the next one, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about everything that's going on with the Black Lives Movement. So in education, how do you think African-American educators should incorporate these conversations about the Black Lives Movement in the classrooms and with their colleagues? Well, to me, if you don't, you're doing an injustice to the students because you know, like my man Sharif El Mekki says, you cannot teach and not incorporate social justice. You can't teach a kid and ignore the daily realities that are going on in their life. If you're doing that, you're not you're not doing justice by the kid. You know, if I'm a kid and I have to go through, you know, metal detectors every day when I get to school, I see two, three police officers monitor my hallways. As an educator, I got to have a conversation with that student about why it is. Because if I don't, then they're going to have a conversation of maybe I am a criminal. I'm being viewed as a criminal. We need to really have these conversations because, trust me, those conversations are occurring. And as okay. educators, one thing we have to do, we have to be the leaders of conversation because we can push them in the right direction and we can get our kids to critically think. And we got to hold our colleagues accountable. One thing I often tell people all the time, look, I can fix you know, we as educators, we can fix bad pedagogy, but we can't fix bad morals, ethics, and views on race. If you possess those types of things, you do not need to be in front of a, cla a, a classroom full of black and brown kids. Or more importantly, you don't need to be in front of a classroom of any kids. Yeah, and so yeah. one thing we as educators do, to do, we need to do a better job is holding ourselves and our colleagues accountable. Because if a colleague says something out of line, to you as another adult in the building, imagine what they're saying when they close the door, when they're dealing with 14, 15, nine-year-olds every single day. So we really need to start holding each other accountable, having these conversations, and stop being scared. You know, mm -hmm. so many people are so scared and want to protect their position in life. But the reality is the only position you have as a teacher is what's best for those kids. 
And having those conversations and leading those conversations is what's best for all of your students. Very true, very true. And for myself, you know, I'm a very advocate for mentoring with African-American boys. And so with the Black Lives Movement, and you tying with the importance of African-American boys in the classrooms, what would you say that is an effective strategy to keep the African-American boys in particular motivated to want to be engaged in the classroom, to want to come in the classroom and learn, despite all the challenges with the Black Lives Movement going on, someone's getting shot or whatever, or even the issues that they face at home, but to continue to try to be motivated in the classroom. Well, one thing you have to do is you have to be open and honest and vulnerable yourself. You know, no kid is going to be open and vulnerable if they feel the teacher is judging them or if they feel the teacher is not open to their conversations. So you have to be open to those conversations. You need to have conversations about mental health. That's something, you know, I used to have a stigma about. But working with my kids, we developed an honest relationship about mental, mental health to the point where AK, I'm going to go to therapy just, just like you all. I want to set right. the example. I want to be the role model. Our kids get so many negative images of what they are supposed to be and who they are. It's our job as educators to counteract that. We need to provide them support. We need to provide them a positive motivational, uplifting information to show them that, look, you can be whatever you want to be. And it's my job as a teacher to help you get there. One thing I always did when I traveled, especially as teacher of the year, if I saw a black person in a, in a unique field, I would take a picture with that person. And when mm. I got to my class, I said, look, a brother flew my airplane the other day. Look, I was on CBS this morning. You know, you know who run that show? Two brothers, you know, I took pictures of them. Two brothers are producers of this show. And so whenever I see somebody doing something that is non-stereotypical, I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to uplift it because our students don't know that that's a viable career path for them. They don't know that this is something I want to do. You know, that kid who likes to take pictures with his iPhone, he may, hey, those guys are producers. Maybe they got started with taking right. pictures with their phones. And so exactly. we always have to motivate and uplift them with stories of stories of success about people who look like them and people who come from their neighborhoods. Because we have to show them that you can do it. And it's so, so, so important that we continue to uplift our boys. Because, man, <laughs> I was quoting Sharif again. I just listened to him on a podcast. He said, it's like the sun. You know, our kids are absorbing those negative vibes, that negative influence that media gives them, like, like they absorb sunlight. So right. our job as educators is we have to come in, we have to provide the shade and we need to provide a space for them to grow and nurture and be who they want to be. Definitely, definitely. Um, so we know that 2020 was a unique time for us last year, and particularly with COVID-19 emerging um, and still going on with things that we are dealing with. As African-American educators, how do you feel that we should directly respond to the needs of African-American students during COVID-19? We need to fight for that equity. You know, a lot of times people talk about equity, but nobody, you know, equity is honestly has become a buzzword in education. You know, we need to make sure that we're, that we're giving our kids equitable practices in the classroom. We need to make sure that they're getting what they need. Start with some fact, we need to make sure that they're getting vaccinated. You know, yes. studies are coming out showing that there's a vast disparity in who's getting the vaccination. You know, our students are scared to go to school because they live with grandma, they live with their auntie or their uncles. You know, they don't want to bring that back to them. And so we need to start making sure, number one, they're getting vaccinated. Number two, we need to make sure they're getting all the resources that every other kid has to be successful. You know, I'm so proud that one of the things Richmond did was overnight we went from a district with no technology to a one-to-one -one technology. Make sure we put devices in the hands of all our students and then made sure we put in hotspots and gave them access to hotspots because we know that those are critical to them learning. Whereas in the counties and other places, they've had this for years. But we overnight, we made it happen. That's what equity looks like, making sure our kids have the tools that are necessary. If it goes to knocking on the doors to making sure, hey, are you going to school? 
going to social media where they're right. at saying, right. hey, you need to get this you know, module done if you want to get your grades. We need to do whatever it takes for our kids to be successful because we know that this game is stacked against them. And so they have to work harder, but the only way they will work harder if they know that we are working harder and that we are showing them that this is what it takes to be successful. And so it starts with just fighting for everything they need. And that's how we get at and holding people accountable. Yes. Holding them state accountable. I think a report came out last week that said that um, African American and English language learners, kindergartners, are having a are gonna have a huge gap between 2019 and 2020 in reading ability. So when we go back to school in the fall, we need to make sure the state understands this and that you have plans in place to support school districts that are predominantly African-American, school districts that are predominantly English language learners. And so it, it really involves holding the entire system accountable to the needs of all of our students. Right. That, that is true. That is true. Showing a sense of care, mm -hmm. knowing that they exist and being advocates for them. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so in conclusion um, with this conversation, again, I definitely want to thank you for your time. Thank you for being willing to have this conversation that is important and relies to educators, in particular African-American. Um, so what thoughts would you have to share to African-American educators and also educators that are in leadership? I know it's hard. You know, we, we, you know, John, Secretary of Education, John King talked about that invisible tax that we all have to pay. That's that tax of, you know, pedagogy plus that cultural tax that we have to provide for all of our students, all the staff, everywhere we work. And it's hard. But one thing we have to understand is we come from a tradition of hard work. You know, you think it's hard now. Imagine what teachers in the 19th you know, black teachers in the 1940s and 30s had to go through when segregated school when they got zero resources, you know? Yes. So we just have to keep in mind that we come from a history of struggle. And as long as we never forget the idea that we come from a history of community, we work together, we work smart, and we make sure that everybody has what they need, not only economically, but socially and culturally. And so we need to make sure that we're working together to ensure that all of our kids have what they need. I often tell the communities where it's at. If you don't have any other African-American educators in your school, reach out to some at other schools. Reach out, reach out to some mm -hmm. in other districts. Reach out to me, you know. We have to right. build that community to make sure that we're all being supported to ensure that all of our kids are successful. Definitely, definitely. Ms. Robinson, thank you so much for your time. Yes. I really appreciate it. Always great talking to you. Um, and definitely, again, I just thank you so much for being who you are and what you do and what you stand for with education, particularly African-Americans, that is notable. So thank you so much for your time. I just want to point out to the Virginia Union folks, you see that? Uh, I see the Virginia State, you know, I was going, I'm not going to forget, I want to let you slide, but I know it is there, but you see this behind me though, right? <laughs> it's like President Abdullah said, we compete. But in the end, we're all fighting the same battles. That's and all. Together. So, yeah. That's it. Well, definitely. Well, you have a great afternoon, and I will talk to you later. You take care. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thank you. It. All right. All right. Bye-bye.